speaker will be will be Island Carlson uh, from the Technical University of Munich. Uh, uh, yes. So uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, pulling this uh, conference together and for allowing me to speak. Um, so, so my title is Dualizability in Higher Morita Categories. And basically I'll start by explaining why I would even care about this notion and this target. And then, uh, and then I'll start uh, getting to the actual words in the title. So, so let's get to it. Um, so I'm not sure if people are familiar with uh, topological field theories or have seen the definition before. So we're gonna start by that. So uh, a TFT is a uh, asymmetric monoidal functor. I hope my writing is understandable. It's often denoted by this uh, curly C and it's uh, out of uh, a category of bordisms and typically into the target uh, being the category of vector spaces. And uh, very briefly, this uh, bordism category, it has objects D minus one dimensional closed manifolds and morphisms D dimensional bordisms, uh, which are maybe unfamiliar words. So I've sketched out a teeny tiny examples for D equals two. So, so the, the one dimensional closed manifolds we have are circles. Uh, so objects will be one circle or a finite disjoint union of circles. And then one example of, of one morphism is drawn out here. You should think of it as, as being a morphism from two copies of the circle into one copy of the circle. This is typically the noted uh, pair of pens. Um, okay, but and then of course you have other morphisms, but, but here they will just be surfaces with boundary basically. Um, okay, which seems fine if you're working with dimension two, but then you can imagine if you want to go up in dimension, it becomes increasingly hard to actually work with this. Uh, so that's one motivation to go to uh, so-called fully extended or local TFTs. So uh, here comes more categorical words. I will again be uh, a symmetric monoidal functor, but now between higher categories. So, so we'll have to have a source an infinity D category of framed bordisms. Uh, you can disregard the frame, it's just technical condition to make things work. And uh, we have to land in some, some suitable symmetric monoidal higher category. Um, and um, so, so this is where these uh, higher Morita categories will appear. Uh, later on, they will be a convenient target but first I want to just sketch out how you should think of this higher category. So, so very informally, uh, you can think of this board uh, D category as having objects frame zero manifolds. So basically points, some finite disjoint union of points. Now our objects will be bordisms between objects. So uh, I've drawn out some examples. So uh, you read them from left to right. This is really the identity on a point. And here we have the cup and the cap. So going first from two points to the empty set and then the empty set to two points. Again, I can also draw the circle going from empty set to empty set. And then uh, I want to continue this. I said it would be a higher category. So uh, our two morphisms will be bordisms between bordisms between objects. Um, and uh, the way to read them is to, to go from the bottom to the top. So uh, here we have two copies of the identity, one morphism on a point, and then uh, you go to this cup and cap after each other, which uh, combined will be a one morphism from two points to two points. And now I have this uh, two morphism between these one morphisms. Uh, and then I also have the pair of pants that we had before from two circles to one circle as examples. 
And then you uh, essentially continue this pattern up to dimension D. I'm just gonna not try to draw it out because that will uh, not be helpful. And um, the way or the reason I said that this is somehow helpful to compute is exactly because I can now chop my manifolds up in even smaller pieces uh, somehow. So that's one part of the motivation and the name fully extended comes from uh, being able to uh, kind of extend all the way down to the point. So um, you see, for example, you should be able to extract one of these normal TFTs from some level, but then you want to also know how to extend it down to a point. So have an assignment that's uh, compatible all the way down to zero dimensional, dimensional manifolds. Okay, so, so I'm aware it's a lot to digest, but that's, that's the overall picture. And now I'll get to, to maybe the more categorical part of this. So, so there is this statement called the cobordism hypothesis, which tells you the following. So uh, a d-dimensional TFT, meaning this kind of symmetric monoidal functor out of this uh, frame cobordism category uh, is equivalent to de-dualizable objects in my target category. And this is a purely categorical uh, condition to work out. So, uh, so in some sense here on the left hand side, you really have to, to care or to understand what these cordisms are. Whereas on the right hand side, you simply work with a categorical notion in uh, the target category that you decide you want to work with. Um, and now I'm uh, lucky enough that the previous speaker already mentioned what uh, dualizable is uh, in the low dimensional case. So, uh, in, so, so asking for one dualizability or an object to be dualizable is exactly uh, having these evaluation and co-evaluation maps. And in the case of uh, vector spaces, that amounts to finite dimensionality. So one way of thinking about uh, Higher dualizability is exactly that it uh, gives you some kind of generalization of a finiteness property for your object. And uh, but since this is a categorical audience, I can also say it, it's it's a question about having uh, certain adjoints on many levels. So um, so I trust you're all familiar with uh, the notion of a functor having a left or right adjoint, but now. You can, of course, translate this uh, into what it means for a one morphism in a two category to have an adjoint. It's pretty uh, straightforward if you try to write it down. And, um, and then you somehow extract certain levels of your higher category here, and you ask for certain of these adjoints to exist. Um, okay, so, so that's the, the motivation that turns us into, into the the categorical side, and I want to at least briefly introduce my favorite target that I'm currently working with, uh, and it's the so-called higher Morita categories. Uh, so it's denoted alg n of s. So s is our underlying category. You can choose to stick in category of vector spaces, chain complexes, or just the category of categories, um, just to give you some examples. But uh, in total, this guy will be an infinity n plus k category when s is an infinity k category. Um, so the motivating example or the reason for the name is the Morita 2 category, which corresponds to alg1 in vector spaces. I'll uh, get to the numbering in a second. So, so the objects you can probably guess will be associative algebras. I give them some names A and B, so forth. Uh, my one morphisms will, will be bimodules. So, so I have a bimodule M, it's an AB bimodule. You should then think of it as a one morphism from A to B. Uh, and then, so, so this is somehow the pattern that you'll also see 
Uh, so up to one, uh, this is what you do. And then after this labeling, the, the morphisms kind of change their nature. We take the morphisms of the underlying category. So here, vector spaces, and we make sure it's compatible with the structure. So in this case, it will just have bimodule homomorphisms. Okay, and then uh, I'll try to go like example driven. So there are additional examples that would also be uh, kind of, or that's part of the motivation that you want to generalize by defining this higher category. So these will be examples of EN algebras. And if you're not familiar with them, then just think of one of these examples. Uh, but in the category of vector spaces, an E1 algebra is exactly an associative algebra. So, so we recover what we would have here. And an E2 algebra is asking for a little bit more, so you get a commutative algebra. Uh, in the category of categories, an E1 algebra is exactly a tensor category. And an E2 algebra is uh, a braided tensor category. And the reason why this one is braided, whereas this one is commutative, is exactly that the category of categories is a two category, whereas vector spaces is a one category. So, um, okay, and then I just, I'll, I'll mention the definitions, but if you're not familiar, then you use the examples to think about this. So, so the two gadgets that are used to construct this higher category is either uh, EN algebras. So these are algebras over the little disk operad or uh, so-called locally constant factorization algebras, which uh, are certain pre cauchys And um, for the sake of this talk, think about them as some kind of geometric version of these EN algebras. Um, so I'll have some pictures on the next slide too. Okay, so um, I'll spell out what this category is in these two versions, and I'm aware I'm like tossing a lot of definitions at you, but I also can't uh, not do it. So, um, so there is this operatic version is using exactly EN algebras. So that uh, refers to the little disk operat or the factorization algebra version. And I should point out, I'm spelling this out for alg2 and uh, for higher n, it will be completely analogous. It will just be more to write and maybe not that much more clarifying. So objects are now E2 algebras in our underlying category uh, or so-called locally constant factorization algebras. Um, and one morphisms will be biomodules of E2 algebras or something called constructible factorization algebras. So they, they live on pictures like these. And then two morphisms will be your bimodules of bimodules or constructible for a little bit more. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, after this level N, the, the morphism changes their structure a little bit and we want to use the underlying category. So here it was for one up to one, we use kind of bimodules of EN algebras. And then here we took a one morphism in vector spaces uh, such that it was compatible. And that's exactly what we do here for, for two plus one morphisms. So three morphisms will be bimodule homomorphisms or homomorphisms of factorization algebras and then uh, continues in a similar fashion for the higher uh, morphisms. Okay, so the next thing to mention is uh, what we know about dualizability in these categories already. And there is uh, one theorem by, by William and Scheinbauer from 2018 that tells you that every object A, uh, so every E in algebra, in this uh, infinity n plus k category, alg n, uh, will be n-dualizable. And uh, if you're familiar with string diagrams, then uh, the arguments really do 
do resemble string diagrams using this factorization algebra version. Uh, but the takeaway I want you uh, to have from this theorem is uh, exactly what happens with the levels here. So, so we know that every object is n-dualizable, but in an infinity n plus k category, it makes sense to ask for um, a dualizability up to n plus k. So, so there is still a lot that is unknown. And for me, my motivation is to define TFTs, then there is the obvious question, like what conditions are necessary to have higher dualizability than n? So um, this is exactly what I am working on currently. So uh, this is a theorem slash conjecture, and I'm just going to state. So it's a theorem for n equals 1 by Lurie. It's a theorem for n equals 2 and the category of categories by Boucher, Jordan, and Snyder. And then I'm working on general S. And then I should still state it as conjecture for higher n. So, so it was conjectured by Lurie. Uh, and it says the following. So an E in algebra, A, so an object in this category will be n plus one dualizable. So one step up from what we already know. If and only if A has adjoints uh, as a module of the factorization homologies. And um, I think factorization homology is a homology theory for frame manifolds with coefficients in E and algebra. So it, it's a black box uh, for now. Uh, but I'll tell you how you can think about it in a very simple example. So, so first of all, how, how does the statement make sense if and only if A has an adjoint as a module of this? So I'll give you one picture that you don't really have the chance to grasp properly, but you'll have to believe me on a certain thing. So if you spell out uh, what this theorem gives you, so, so I said these resemble st string diagrams, the arguments, and if you spell it out in ALG2, um, you'll get something that looks like this uh, left-hand side. Uh, so that is one of the two morphisms that you need to, to look at and to find uh, an adjoint for. But if we spell out what this condition gives us, uh, it will look like, so, Okay, so, so for n equals 2 and k equals 2, we should look at the surface uh, that is S1 cross R. So that's really the annulus on the outside. So this part, up to me not being able to draw. And, um, and I said that A should act as a module of this, and A is exactly what you attach to the disk. So to this, you attach A. And then to the annulus, we, we attach something that factorization homology tells us that was the black box. And then uh, the module structure comes from, from stacking annuli outside. So, I mean, I, I can stack another annulus and it doesn't matter if I, if I stack the two annuli together and then add them to the disk or if I do it one by one. So that is exactly the module structure. Uh, and, and then the, the takeaway is exactly that uh, this is what the conjecture would give us, which is uh, homeomorphic to, to what, uh, what, what we know we should look at from, from this theorem. Um, OK, and, and hopefully also appreciate that this factorization algebra version is a, is a geometric gadget to work with this in some sense. And then uh, I just want to, to finish with uh, why I care about this. So, uh, so given this cobordism hypothesis, it would give us TFTs one dimension up from what we already know. And it's also a condition that's needed for, for so-called invertibility, which would give you invertible TFTs. Uh, and I, I realize I may be a more physics-driven in some sense than uh, uh, others in this conference, but uh, for me, those are very interesting <laughs> uh, kind of, kind of uh, structures to work with, I guess. So, 
thank you for, for the attention and uh, for letting me speak again. Otherwise, that. Um,